After me, I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Sangha. Keeping the palms joined. Palms down. <clears throat> so, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Dharma Bum Temple on a Saturday morning. I hope this is where you intended to be. If not, you're at the wrong place. So you should run quickly now. Um, thank you. Uh, I usually say this at the end, but I'll say it now. Thank you again, as always, for working with us as we um, screen you and microchip you and Take your social security number as you enter the building. Um, these are things that allow us as a organization and facility to open and be comfortable with having people in the space, which most of you know, for 16 months, we were closed. So um, someone just said to me, how was your summer? And I said, well, we were closed. So what does that tell you? Um, you know, it was, it was rough being closed, but the beauty of it was we got to build a virtual Dharma Bump Temple, which is really cool. And uh, after 16 months of building a virtual Dharma Bump Temple, conditions were such that we were able to open the physical temple. So the beauty of that now is we get to run two temples, <laughs> a virtual temple and an actual physical temple. So um, an early good morning to our millions of YouTube followers. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, but yeah, so we appreciate you practicing patience as we sign you in um, as you enter. Like I said, uh, it allows us to be comfortable hosting people. And I'm sure most of you would not be comfortable if you were sitting in a small space like this with 80 people right now, um, four, four to a few with absolute strangers um, breathing on you. So that's not the best way to keep things healthy and safe. So again, thank you for, for putting up with that. Um, you know, it's been an incredible practice, not just for us, but for the community. 
uh, the people that we've known for many years and also the new people to deal with um, change and the Buddhist teachings around impermanence. And that even in running a Buddhist temple, you know, we talk about impermanence day in and day out. Yet the general structure of a Dharma bum temple for 14 years was exactly the same, right? Not much changed. We did things the same way, week in and week out. But, you know, a few changes here and there, things arise. Um, but then something happens and you're forced to completely alter the way you do things. And uh, that can be very challenging um, if you allow it to be. Or you can just take it for, you know, in my favorite, probably one of my favorite books, if not the favorite, Zen Mind, Beginner Mind by Shinra Suzuki, where he talks about beginner's mind. And so really life is about having this beginner's mind and recognizing that every moment you are breathing, you have never experienced that moment ever. And part of the reason we struggle with suffering, depression, dukkha, dissatisfaction, is that we carry stories with us. And we relive those stories over and over and over in our heads. Anyone carrying around a story for the last 10 or 20 years? I didn't even finish the question. Your hand already went up. <laughs> You're all like, yep, I'm in. Right? So we carry these stories in our heads for so many years, and then they lead us to here. But the crazy thing is you're all sitting here on a Saturday morning in the year 2021. And for some reason, you have some idea that this is going to help something from like 1997. Right? Gone. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. Doesn't mean it didn't exist. Doesn't mean it didn't impact you. But I can't heal that or fix that today. Buddhist practice doesn't heal that or fix that today. The practice of understanding impermanence. And the beginner's mind is to recognize that whatever happened to you in 1997, most likely it's not happening right now in this moment. And so beginner's mind is allowing ourselves to just be present with each moment as it arises. And you let go of these heavy expectations and heavy judgments and heavy critiques of the world. So for us as a practice, it was like, OK, well, maybe we've been running a temple a certain way for 14 years, but that's gone. We have a much larger health issue, health condition that we must be mindful and aware of and respectful of, regardless of what individuals think, right? What I mean by that is everybody thinks something differently, right? You don't hear a teacher, educator in that profession, never walk into a classroom and try to please 30 students. It just doesn't happen. And so we as an organization, we say, OK, well, how are we going to err on the side of caution? And how can we try to embody what impermanence and beginner's mind really is? And that means we do things that are different for a lot of you. So whatever you're trying to get through and heal from the past, um, beginner's mind is a lifesaver because it allows you to just say, here I am. And what am I going to do in this moment going forward? And if you spend the rest of your life thinking about everything from the past and allowing the past to wear you down and destroy you and devastate you and crush you, you're missing a lot of the beauty that's around us today. And yes, there's a lot of trauma and pain and suffering in this room, outside these walls and around the world. And there's also a lot of beauty and kindness and care and love. So... The practice is to be present with all of that as it arises. All right. So with that being said, everything else the rest of your life should be a piece of cake. So you are good to go. Um, but we'll go ahead and do some meditation anyway, since most people show up for that. and Most people think that's the thing that's going to save you or fix you. Um, all it's going to do is keep you relatively still for the next three hours. <laughs> so, uh, a couple things I'll tell you before we begin with the meditation practice. Nothing's going to happen to you, right? You will not float away. Uh, you will not have any mystical, magical experiences. The mind that races all day long is not going to shut off. Don't judge your practice, meaning don't ask yourself, is it working or not working? Are you doing it right or doing it wrong? 
we're just going to sit, we're going to breathe. You'll hear sounds, helicopters, movements, right? This is life. Life is filled with sounds. Life is filled with chaos. This practice is learning to get quiet and still within all of the chaos. Posture, you just want to be comfortable. If you're on a cushion, often it helps slide into the front third, pushing the stomach forward, allows the back to straighten slightly. Shoulders are relaxed. Hands can be on the knees or in the lap, whatever is comfortable. If you're on a chair or a bench, also just trying to sit up straight, relaxing the shoulders. Hands on the knees or in the lap. If you need to move during meditation, simply move. Movement doesn't make you a bad meditator, it just means your leg hurts. I will guide us as we begin, and we'll settle into a little bit of silence, which won't actually be for three hours. And starting with the eyes closed, if comfortable, or slightly open. Mouth is open or closed, whatever's comfortable. We'll start with taking three deep breaths, slowly. And eventually, settle into a natural rhythm of the breath. Noticing the mind as it wanders, jumping from thought to thought. Start with gently guiding the attention, focus to the stomach or chest. Breathing in, feel them rise. Breathing out, feel them fall. Simply continue this practice, observing sensation of breath, expecting nothing but to sit and breathe.
As the mind wanders, lost in thought, recognizing, release that thought, return attention, focus to the breath. Letting go of expectations. Letting go of judgments from your practice. Just sitting. Breathing. Keeping the mind alert, aware. 
aware of each sound. Each thought. Each physical sensation. Yet concerned with nothing but sitting, breathing. And with the body still, resting, and 
the speech quiet, aware of all sounds. And the mind learning to settle. Know what it's like to just sit and breathe. Knowing with each breath, there's nothing else to do. Nowhere else to go. No one else to be. Everything beautiful, exactly as it is. Sitting, breathing. Once again, taking three deep breaths slowly. <clears throat> As you slowly open the eyes, slowly beginning to move, most important with the practice of meditation is to recognize how you feel now, immediately after. Compare this to how you typically feel throughout your day. Recognize the difference, if there is one. Ask yourselves how you prefer to feel every day for the rest of your life. And realize however you feel now, if it's quiet, calm, still, or a busy mind, racing mind, whatever you're sitting with at this moment has nothing to do with anything I said. It's nothing to do with how we sit and hold the hands across the legs. It's nothing to do with the sounds around us or anything else for that matter. It has everything to do with your own mind and your own mind's reaction to an external condition. This is what the Buddha called Pratitya Samupata, means dependent origination. This is the basis of the Buddha's awakening. The word Buddha simply means awakened. He was a human being no different than any one of us who 
began to understand why he suffered, why he got angry, sad, depressed, stressed, anxious. He began to understand the causal relationship of all phenomena. What that means very simply for all of us, regardless of where you come from or what you believe in or where you think you're going, your whole life is filled with things that happen. You react. More stuff happens. More reactions. That's what we get every day. Practice of meditation is learning what it's like to respond to something quietly, peacefully, still. Because for most of us, the way you responded to the last 20 minutes is quite different from how you respond to everything else that's happening throughout your day. And so all we're working on is closing the gap to where the way you feel now is closer to how you feel always. Just as driven, motivated, productive, successful, whatever that means to you in your respective lives. But with a mind that's steady, clear, focused, distracted by nothing, disturbed by no one. It's not an easy practice. It's not necessarily fun. But meditation is free. Buddhist practice is free. Sitting, breathing, becoming aware of what you think, what you say, and what you do. Meditation is not an escape from reality. If your life is a crazy, hectic mess, this will not fix it. This will make you become aware of your life that's a crazy, hectic, stressed out mess. So you can begin to make changes. So I'm a little disappointed because I had actually requested the helicopters to fly above us for 30 minutes. <laughs> so they owe me some money. I paid for 30 minutes of helicopter use. I only got about 15. You know, sometimes life is like that. It's a great example. A lot of you have known me many years, always hear me talk about things like phones ringing during meditation, which I love. Um, you know, disturbances, coughing, not during COVID times, but, you know, <laughs> pre-pandemic when somebody would cough, it wasn't seeming like the end of the world. But all these things that cause discomfort during meditation, I think are incredibly important to happen because that's more reflective of your daily life. For those who might be brand new or newer, there's often this misconception that if I just find my perfect little happy place somewhere far away from home, that everything is going to be fine. And so we create or find places like a temple or yoga practice or whatever it could be going to the beach or the ocean, right? Out in the grass field, whatever it might be. Often we create these places and things that we go to, to escape, to have a quiet, peaceful time. And I'm not saying that that is bad or wrong. Those things are very healthy, very important. But this idea that creating those things is the only thing that's going to make your life feel uh, like you have some sense of sanity, that is the problem. The problem is you're running from your existing life to a place or idea that you think is going to be the key to your happiness. When in fact, the key to learning to be happy and at peace is being okay during meditation with helicopters flying above your head. The helicopters didn't ruin anything, right? In fact, for a while there, just so you get some insight into my crazy head, I was like, I wonder what they're looking for or who usually. And then I thought, maybe they're in here. And then I thought maybe this is literally my chain of thoughts. Like it happens very quick. It'll take me a million times longer to describe it. But I was like, who are they looking for? Maybe they're here. Maybe it's me. What did I do? I did nothing. I'm good. <laughs> and then I was like, back to the breath. <laughs> right? Like all of that happened in between one breath, those thoughts. Right? That's the joy of what this meditation practice will do for you is it doesn't change anything. Right? I've been doing this stuff a long time. My mind is not like, I'm not sitting up here in this like, you know, um, euphoric state. My head is just as much of a mess as everybody else's. You just become aware of it. You find humor in the madness 
and you don't do anything, right? I didn't start looking around to see who did it. I didn't run out the back door trying to escape, right? That was when I realized I didn't do it. But you, you just learn to sit with things, just like helicopters. So your entire day today, Right? It's still early. It's a Saturday. Do you have any idea how many things in your life today are going to go completely differently from how you want them to? A lot. And the practice is learning to be okay with that, embracing that. It doesn't mean you just accept terrible situations and do nothing about it. As I always talk about, Buddhist practice doesn't mean you become a doormat and allow yourself to be physically, mentally, emotionally abused if that's what's going on. You get up and you remove yourself from those situations. So when I say learning to be with okay with things as they are, there's an asterisk there that says if you're in environments that are completely unhealthy and unsafe, then you need to remove yourself from that environment for your safety. But aside from those types of things, you know, when someone makes your sandwich later today the wrong way or your latte isn't brewed to perfection or you got a you know grande instead of a venti and it had three pumps instead of two, like you'll live. <laughs> to me, this is what Buddhist practice is in a, in a world that we live in, right? And so the helicopters, um, I think are perfect examples for life. So if you're here for the first time, I'm sure you weren't like thinking, I can't wait to go to the Dharma Bum temple and listen to helicopters, <laughs> right? But what I want to talk about briefly, other than helicopters, um, and then just open up to questions. Um, someone asked me right as I was coming in uh, to, uh, well, they didn't necessarily ask me to talk about it. They just said, I'd like for you to sometime to talk about the precepts. This was about two minutes before we started. So I spent hours preparing for my talk on precepts. Um, <laughs> and so I just want to touch on them somewhat briefly. And then we'll kind of open up to questions. But I just want to walk through what precepts are. Um, in Buddhist practice, uh, there are what's known as the five precepts. Now, there are anywhere from um, 227 to like 300 something precepts that were set up by the Buddha at the time of the Buddha 2,500 years ago for the Sangha. The Sangha was the group of monks and nuns that gathered together. And it wasn't like the Buddha sat down and made a whole list of rules. The rules weren't there to like restrict you or make your life miserable. The precepts were put into place because as things started to arise that created conflict in the Sangha, in the community, they said, well, we probably shouldn't do that. That will cause conflict. That will cause conflict. I was looking for another word, but we'll stick with <laughs> conflict. It'll cause problems, right? So they created precepts, right? Now, the first five, which are very common for lay Buddhists to take or just for people to explore right throughout their life. And you can Google precepts and you can see all the two to three hundred precepts that are out there. And chances are, you know, we're all violating all of them and we're still decent human beings. It's OK. But before I get into what they are briefly, I want to introduce precepts more as like traffic lights. Right. Um. Who here drives? When you drive and you come to a red light, what do you do? Always? Such a good driver you are. <laughs> what are other options? Go. Go. Stop and go. This is easy. Right? So we have many options. We don't have to stop, but we choose to stop. Why do we choose to stop at a red light sometimes? What happens if you run the red light? Get a ticket, something about other people, accident, die, die. Kill, someone. kill someone. What else could happen if you run a red light? Nothing, Nothing <laughs> says the guy who's always running red lights with a smile underneath the mask. You can't see smiles under a mask. You have to look at the eyes, you know. So stay away from David when you're driving home today. Uh, but we could run the red light and get away with it, right? We get there quicker. So lots of things happen. But we choose usually to stop at a red light because it's safe. I look at precepts the same way. The ones I'm going to introduce, you can do all of them as much as you want. And the chances are, if your life has difficulties, challenges, conflicts, troubles, dissatisfaction, what the Buddha called dukkha, suffering, chances are some of these things 
may possibly be a part of your life or have been a part of your life and led to conflict in the past, right? So the first one is you know, to refrain from lying. Anyone in here lie? If your hand's not up, you're lying, right? So to refrain from lying, often we lie. We lie to protect ourselves. We lie to protect others. We lie because we're just afraid of the truth. We lie because we don't want people to know. There are so many reasons. We don't have enough time right now to get into all of it. But there are a million reasons why we lie about things. We lie to ourselves. Often people talk about when, you know, I've led kind of groups where we'll spend an hour on each precept just talking about them. Some people share that their biggest lie that they're, uh, uh, stuck with the most is the lies they tell themselves, you know? So we're often lying. And when we lie, we run the risk of hurting ourselves, damaging ourselves and damaging others. Right. The second one is to refrain from killing. Right. Now my hope is nobody murdered anyone this morning. Right. But killing isn't just about that. Right. All sentient beings to refrain from killing, harming. Right. This precept really comes from refrain from harming. Any sentient being, anything with consciousness. So, yes, that includes spiders and ants and cockroaches and all those wonderful sentient beings that you love to shower with and wake up to and, you know, invite into your home, right? Now, I love when people argue about that, but they don't want to look at the other things we kill. All the animals that we harm and kill for our consumption, right? Right? They're not doing anything wrong. I have a dear friend who always says, she always gets really sad around Halloween because she says it's not the pumpkin's fault. They didn't do anything, you know? And again, my intention here isn't to like ruin your Halloweens, but just the idea that we just take so much harm onto others, humans, animals, all sentient beings. We kill people's time, we kill their energy, we kill their heart. So we often put a lot of harm out there into the world, including to ourselves. So the practice is to refrain from killing, from harming self and others, right? The next one is no stealing. Right? This is great with a college group a couple of years ago. We, uh, I'll open up and I'll you know, ask people to share what they steal. And one of the kids was talking about every time they go to the dining hall, of whatever it's called, they just steal silverware because they didn't have money to buy their own. So they just started stocking up at home all the silverware from the... Uh, from the dining hall, right? But we take things that aren't ours. Very similar to the killing, we can take people's attention, we can take their time, right? Very often stealing isn't just like, you know, physical, tangible, like stealing a book or something like that. But often we just, we take from others. Um, so be mindful of all of these things. So no lying, no killing, no stealing. Next one, sexual misconduct, right? These are, often it comes up, and again, this is a longer conversation, but for those who are brand new to Buddhism, being Buddhist doesn't mean that you can't have sexual relationships or sexual interaction with others. It doesn't mean you can't marry or have partners or things like that, right? The Buddha left that life. The monks and nuns chose to live a life of the renunciate path. So they chose as monks and nuns to have no physical contact whatsoever, right? We are not monks, we are not nuns, we are living our lives. So when you look at sexual misconduct, it has a lot to do with what is your intention behind the action? What do we look at? How do we look at people, right? When you're walking on the streets and you pass people, right? Are you looking at them physically? Like what do, what do they physically look like? Or are you actually looking at them like they're just human beings and not physical objects, right? How do we actually look at people? What do we stare at? Pornography. Things on the internet, these types of things that have so much trauma and abuse tied to them. Are we allowing that to continue? Right? So sexual misconduct isn't so simple as just taking advantage of somebody. It was a great master years ago. He talked about sexual misconduct and he said, anytime two people have any interactions whatsoever, do they both understand where the other person is coming from and are they okay with it? Do they fully understand and are they okay with it, with what's going on? So another one to explore. And the last one is no intoxicants, to refrain from intoxicants. There's a whole list of intoxicants very often just gets summed up as no drugs or alcohol, right? 
Now, it was great a handful of years ago that legalized marijuana and then all the stoners out there want to argue why it's OK to use marijuana. And I used to be a stoner, so no offense to anyone who you know, got offended by that. Right. But that was the argument. Well, now it's legal. Well, so is lying. <laughs> right. Lots of things are legal. It doesn't make them OK. Right. These are not judgments. This always comes up around the intoxicants. Right. Most of the time, it's an early class, so maybe. Like or something? Say again? Like Tylenol? I'll get to that. The question was, was that include Tylenol? I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so it's an early class. Usually the nighttime class, I always say that after this talk, people go home and they're having their glass of wine or beer talking about no intoxicants, right? And the practice is not to judge yourself for doing that. This isn't like you're a bad Buddhist because you have a glass of wine. It's to understand why do we turn to things, Right. Why do we turn to drugs? Why do we turn to alcohol? Can we stop if we want to? And how does our use of them impact our life and the life of those around us, right? So if you have a headache and you take two Tylenol, you're okay. But if you're, pop, if you're popping 18 Tylenol every day, just to, well, you know, so that's, that's the reality, right? Prescription medication, this isn't about like, I went to my Buddhist thing, so I should stop my meds. Please stay on your meds. <laughs> For the benefit of all of us in this room. Right. right? So this isn't about that. It's understanding. And again, I use the college kids example because it's fascinating to give a talk with 50 college kids at San Diego State on no lying, no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no intoxicants. I've just summed up basically their entire college experience. <laughs> right? So understand why are we doing these things? Right. If you use marijuana because it helps with your migraines, then are you only using it when you have a migraine? Or are you doing it morning, afternoon and night? Right. The question is, why are we doing these things? Can we stop and how will it impact our life? So really important to explore, um, you know, especially from an addiction standpoint. Right. So precepts to refrain from lying, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, and intoxicants, right? Intoxicants really goes into anything that alters the state of mind. And you can Google it and you'll see all kinds of stuff that the Buddha said alters the state of mind, right? Lots of things alter our state of mind. And um, again, I want to be very clear, right? Let's just say you go out for lunch and you order a cheeseburger with a beer, that doesn't make you a bad person. Just recognize what you're participating in and recognize that there's probably not anything wrong with having an A beer, right? 12 might be an issue, right? I don't know too many people who do wonderful kind things after 12 beers. So keep that in mind. Someone asked my master years ago and uh, he said the, that uh, in their culture, for business, when they close a business deal, it's uh, common for them to just raise a glass and to cheers and have a drink. And he felt in his culture it'd be disrespectful if he didn't do that. And the master said, well, then by all means, raise your glass, take a drink, and then put the glass down. Don't sit there and get hammered with them for the next two hours. So be mindful of this stuff. So with that, I'll pause. Um, I'll open up to questions, meditation, Buddhist practice, precepts, um, anything that's on your mind, and I'll use the rest of the time for that. Did that address your question on the Tylenol? Yeah. yeah. The one thing I will say about Advil is, is I use this for Tylenol. It's a great example that often we have a headache, we take Advil. We have another headache, we take Advil. Next thing you know, we spend our entire lives taking Advil or Tylenol for headaches. The question is, why do you keep getting the headaches to begin with? That's what you really want to explore. Why are we constantly seeking, craving, and desiring something to fix something that potentially we're creating. So, questions? Could that be like true for like a milkshake too? Like if you're addicted to milkshakes, like sugar? So, the question was, could that be true if you're addicted to milkshakes, like if you're addicted to sugar? So the precept of intoxicants is to refrain from anything that alters the state of mind Sugar, of course, does, but really what you're, to me, the way I hear the name. the argument that is like mind and body? Hang on. Forget the argument for a minute. What I'm suggesting is that look at 
the addiction and craving and desire of what it is versus am I or am I not following the precept? The danger of introducing precepts is if you've never heard them before, the danger is now you've got some scale in your head and you're like, okay, I did three of five today. I'm a bad Buddhist, right? That's not the point. The point is to explore if you have an addiction to sugar, to milkshakes, then explore the addiction. The Buddha taught that we suffer tremendously because of our cravings and our desires and begin to understand what is the cause of this craving and desire, right? So that's what you want to really explore with anything that you're potentially addicted to is the underlying um, emotions and trauma that are potentially leading to the craving and desire to begin with. Yeah, go ahead, Bonnie, and then, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying, out of the six parameters, Prasna parameter is everyone talks about. Yes. Is it possible that you explain that this is a bad time? Yes. So the question of, uh, the question was out of the paramitas, Prajna Paramita is the question that, or is the one that most people talk about. Can I explain it? So let me, in brief, just sum up for those who don't know what the Paramitas are. Uh, the Paramitas, there's in Buddhism what we call the Bodhisattva path. It's in the Mahayana school of Buddhism. Bodhisattva means enlightened being. It doesn't mean like you're a perfect person. The Bodhisattva vow is to be reborn life after life, to liberate all from suffering. So think of it as just going through each day, being a good person to help others. You can all do that, right? Beautiful. Bunch of bodhisattvas in this room. So the bodhisattva practice to go from a world of dukkha, which is discomfort, just, you know, dissatisfaction, angst, suffering, to free from suffering, samsara, liberation, nirvana, right? How do we do this? We use what's called the six paramitas, which I talk about a lot. And the six tusks on Samantha Padra here represent the six paramitas on the elephant here. And the six paramitas are generosity, morality, patience, diligence, concentration, and wisdom. Another six things for you to practice. Generosity, morality, patience, diligence, concentration, wisdom. My master, this was the heart of her practice, was the Bodhisattva path and the six paramitas. And the Prajna Paramita, the last one, is wisdom. This is the perfection of wisdom, right? And... So very often, almost always, I describe Prajnaparamita, the wisdom uh, practice, as doing the first five, right? I cannot sit here. Well, let me back up. The Buddha praised Sabuti, his, one of his wisest disciples, for Sabuti's discourse on wisdom. You know what Sabuti said about wisdom? Nothing. <laughs> and the Buddha said, good job. Right. So what I take from that teaching is that for me as a practitioner to sit here and tell you what wisdom is, that would be pretty foolish on my end. But we overcome ignorance. Right. You have the root cause of our suffering, greed, anger, ignorance called the three poisons. We overcome ignorance with the practice of wisdom. So for me as a practitioner, what I share is instead of saying this is wisdom, I could say, do you, Bonnie, know when you're being ignorant or when we're being greedy or when we're being angry. Do you all know when you're being that way? So the practice of wisdom would be be less greedy, be less angry, be less ignorant. If we have less ignorance, we automatically have a greater level of wisdom. That to me is the Prajnaparamita, the perfection of wisdom, less ignorance. I could sit here for hours and talk about my ignorance, but to talk about my wisdom would be pretty quick talk, right? So um, we have a Dharma, we run a summer program usually pre-pandemic and it's based on the Paramitas and we have a quote and a description of all of the Paramitas. And our description for wisdom, the whole page by uh, design is left blank. Because we want to be very careful about saying to people, this is wisdom. So, but 
we could all share our ignorance. And most important, not so much sharing it, is become aware of your own ignorance, your own greed, and your own anger. This is what the Buddha said is the cause of our suffering. Again, the three poisons, as it's referred to. So I hope it's so fun to spend your whole life becoming aware of your ignorance. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned don't like intoxicate your mind. Um, but so, do you think that there's part of your mind which can maybe only get access by like smoking weed or psychedelics? Because sometimes when I smoke weed, I'll be like, I've been very unkind to this person, for example. And I wouldn't have thought of that, but I've not been. Smoking well, maybe weed. you should think about it when you're not smoking weed. <laughs> yeah. Are you smoking weed right now? Not right now. Did you smoke an hour ago? No. Two hours ago? Not today. Okay. So what you just proved to me in, and again, the, uh, trust me, I was a stoner all through high school. I, so this is not a judgment. I'm just going to challenge you from someone who is, you know, I'm sure you're just asking for others, but coming from my perspective of someone who's been there, what you just proved to me with your question is you have the ability to be aware that sometimes you're kind and sometimes you're unkind without smoking weed. You could argue this. We don't have enough time for the argument. But the practice is to recognize that if smoking weed is the only way that one is aware of being unkind, then you have a lot of work to do. And I mean that with all the love in the world. And the smoking weed won't fix it. It's like what you're saying is, and I've, Dude, I've, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time and I've heard every excuse and every angle and they're all valid and they're all wonderful and they're all great awakenings to recognize like, wow, I really have to smoke weed to realize what an asshole I am. That's a serious problem. And explore that. I'm not attacking you. I'm not even talking to you. This is a general statement. I mean, I think the broader question was, do you not think that it gives you a different perspective on Okay, you two can argue outside. Here's, here's, here's my, what I want you to explore. Lots of things give us different, I see your hand, hang on, patience, 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 right? Lots of things give us different perspectives. The question is, not to challenge it, the question is, can I have different perspectives when I'm not smoking weed? And if we need weed to have different perspectives, there's an issue there. There really is. Um, again, church bells are ringing. I don't have enough time to get into the... No, I just have a quick question. Hang on. Hang on. So I, I want to be... Travis, what's the name of that article? Uh, it's, it's the journey, not the trip. There's an article in Tricycle or... Yeah. In Tricycle, Matt, you familiar with Tricycle? Tricycle Magazine, Google Tricycle Magazine, it's the journey, not the trip. By Brad, and, Brad, by Brad Warner. And it's a beautiful article um, in a much longer, eloquent way than me snapping back at you for like 30 seconds. That'll give you more to think about. Um, what I want to be mindful of for all of us in this room, when I bring up precepts, they will absolutely push your buttons. Right? <laughs> Tell me, like, anyone here brand new to Buddhism today? Like, this is your first Buddhist class ever? One, two, right? So you're like, wait a minute. I, I can't lie, steal, or kill, or get high. This sucks. <laughs> I'm done with this Buddhist crap, right? That's not the point. The point here is to recognize how these things impact your life. How often you use them. And when I bring them up, if you have such this, like, visceral reaction to any of them, not just the intoxicants, right? Any of them, if you have this visceral reaction that like really just rubs you the wrong way and you want to like break it down and explore it and all this kind of stuff, that's a really good thing, right? I mean, I'm challenging back at you, but I love these questions because what it means is it's, it's hopefully given you an opportunity now to explore like, wow, could I possibly have different perspectives without that. And what would that be like? Huh. Interesting. So 
Last quick question. I may or may not address it because we're out of time. Like, um, weed for healing. Like, if you only do it like once a week or something. So, same thing. We ourselves as humans are really good at justifying why we use things. Weed for healing, if you only use it once a week or so, was your question. So, again, I take questions and I respond to them in general, not personally to the person who asked it. So when I say things back to either one of you, please try to make sure you understand I'm not attacking either of you. I'm trying to push buttons. Yeah. So weed for healing if you only use it once a week or so. So the question is, when you use it, do you actually need it for healing? Or are you just sitting there thinking like, okay, well, it's Tuesday. It's my day to get high because I need to heal. Right? Like a big part of the practice of the precepts, the first one is to refrain from lying. And I suggest that all of us be honest with ourselves around these precepts. Don't judge yourself. I have done all five. I have, you know, I've spent the majority of my life doing everything opposite of the five precepts. The practice is not to judge yourself or critique yourself or think you're a bad person. I'm repeating myself, but with the precepts, I really want to drive this home. It's to explore how does this impact my life and why. Um, I'm going to stop there because we're, yeah, I'll, I'll respond after if you want. But So with that being said, we'll close. We'll join palms. May the benefit of this practice be shared with all beings in all directions. May all be at peace. May all be free from suffering. May any merit gained from this practice be transferred to the more than 4 million lives that have been lost during the pandemic and to their family and friends who continue to suffer to this day. May they all be at peace and free from suffering. May we all be at peace and free from the causes and conditions that lead to suffering. All right, so a few quick announcements um, before y'all head out. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Jeff. I'm a Dharma bum. Uh, we opened up this temple nearly 15 years ago to introduce Buddhist practice to those who show up. Uh, those of us who lead, we're not monks or nuns. We're not gurus. We're not masters. We're not teachers. We're not looking for students. We're just practitioners. We do our best to take our unenlightened view of Buddhist teachings and share it with those who show up. Um, so I appreciate you showing up. Uh, just about every night, we have different classes going on, uh, different people leading uh, different Buddhist practices. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we were here for 14 years, and then pandemic forced us to close for 16 months. So we just opened up about two months ago again, um, and we're opening very slowly and cautiously. So we only have classes Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night from 7 to 8, and Saturday morning, 11 to 12. We also sit Monday through Friday, 8 and 8.30. It's a silent meditation. There's no, no one leading it. There's no teaching. It's just two 30-minute silent meditations. Uh, it's a beautiful practice. And then the temple is closed all day. And then it opens up again in the evening if we have a class. Um, Buddha for You gift shop, same thing downstairs, is open Saturday, Sunday, 12 to 3. And then an hour during the week, 6 to 7, um, before the class. So um, uh, we look forward to hopefully being open to our normal um, you know, what we're used to, but right now we're just grateful that we can be open at all. We have two beautiful programs also online, uh, virtual practice, uh, Tonglin Sunday night at seven led by Kayla and Amy. Uh, anyone who wants healing for themselves or others, think of it as like putting prayer requests out there. It's a Tibetan Buddhist practice of sending and receiving compassion. So, um, you can go to the website, you can put like a little 30 second blurb in there and they'll, you don't have to be there, but they'll throw their name out. Um, as they send compassion and, and healing. So that's Sunday nights at seven. And then one of my favorites is our Homeless Hats Project, Knit and Sit. 
as a lot of you know, we've been feeding the homeless and working with homeless for 15 years, and we've put all that on hold. Um, but we do have a, uh, a group that meets every Sunday via Zoom, and they do a little uh, meditation, and then they uh, knit and do, uh, they make beanies. Um, they gather here now once a month uh, and are now distributing the beanies downtown. So um, we've made a few hundred hats um, for people on the streets, which is really beautiful. So that's the name knit and sit. Um, other than that, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, beautiful questions. The precept talk is always fun. It always gets stuff going. Um, and uh, if I hadn't said it enough, as Shinru Suzuki said, you're all perfect exactly how you are. You all could use a little improvement. So please don't judge and critique yourself. You've done that enough, most likely your whole life. Um, learn to just appreciate being alive and having the experience of, of, of the breath. So um, thanks all for being here. I wish you well and uh, good luck.